Welcome to the Insight to Action podcast. I'm your host, Donna Jones. My work involves transforming organizations and leaders to adapt to today's world. Today we're talking about self-management, which is the best vehicle for companies to use in order to become more fluent and fluid with changing realities. If there's one name in the self-management conversation that comes up repeatedly, it's the company Morningstar, along with uh, Ricardo Samler Semco in Brazil. With me today is Doug Kirkpatrick. Doug was with Morningstar from the very beginning as a CFO, and he has now uh, been part of, since 2008, the Morningstar Self-Management Institute. He's been a champion of self-management since time began, but certainly since 2008, and has been speaking all over the world, including Siberia and some fascinating destinations, with companies who are really aware of the fact that, that there's a different approach required, not just to tackle disengagement, but also to be competitive, period. So, Doug, let's talk about your new release of your, of your book, Beyond Empowerment, and why did you call it that? Let's jump in. Absolutely. So let me make one minor correction to your intro, Donna, and that is I never had the title of CFO. So Morning Stars never had titles. Uh, no one had a title. No one has a title today. I performed the functions of a financial controller. If uh, I was pushed, I would describe that to outside entities, but uh, never claimed the title of CFO. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear up front. No titles. Beyond empowerment really comes from the idea that, you know, in the last two or three decades, we've had lots of companies adopt empowerment programs, and and it's a way to, I suppose, drive engagement and increase uh, uh, autonomy and and, uh, agency on the part of uh, employees to give them a greater sense of ownership and help them feel like they're part of the action. The reason I called it Beyond Empowerment is that there's a very large flaw at the heart of empowerment programs, and that is that traditional empowerment involves someone with power transferring, lending his or her power to another person, a subordinate who has less power. And the flaw is that anything that you lend can be repossessed at any time. So I I can lend you my power. I can ask you to take that power to start a new empowerment program. And if I don't like the way you start the new empowerment program, I will take my power back and and take take power away from you. And that's not real empowerment. That's faux empowerment. And so... Why I called the book Beyond Empowerment is that in a self-managed ecosystem, everyone has all the power they need from the time they start work. So they have power to acquire resources, they have power to build relationships, they have power to grow and develop and learn, uh, they have power to collaborate, they have all the power they need you know, with no inherent barriers to the exercise of that power other than those that they've freely negotiated voluntarily with others in the organization. And so when you are truly empowered, you cannot be fired. You're not subject to command authority. You can't be told what to do by another person. There's really zero command authority. And so people are autonomous agents. They are seeking excellence. They are pursuing the vision and the enterprise. And this is not empowerment of one person to another. This is a state that lies beyond empowerment. It's a state of true agency, autonomy, and self-management. Good good reasons, all of them, that's for sure. There's been some skepticism about using self-management, and, and basically that whole business of distributing power uh, generates a certain degree of skepticism which in some instances you could say, okay, the skepticism is healthy because it questions the status quo and you get to to see what's underneath it. The other side of it is is people are afraid to actually try something different. What do you say to some of the skeptics around self-management and why people actually are quite capable of contributing and you can trust them to do what they were hired to do? The starting point is, to remind people that everyone is a self-manager in his or her own personal life. So 
uh, when we're uh, leading our lives, we make gigantic decisions on our own without a boss. So all of our life decisions are made somehow by ourselves individually as self-managers free of coercion. And so we decide, you know, what to do for a living and where to live and, and who to marry, all these kinds of things. So everyone's already a manager. It's only when we enter the workplace that, for whatever reason, we're considered, you know, not competent to manage ourselves. And really, the the idea of self-management in an organization, if a person knows what to do and how to do it, it kind of begs the question, why do you need a boss other than the overall mission of the enterprise? If you are, are willing to come in and perform a role in pursuit of a particular purpose uh, and you know what to do, you know how to do it, you know, or you can acquire the skills to do it, then what what possible uh, necessity is there for a boss to be able to supervise you or to watch you or tell you what to do? So we do need to have systems in place that uh, help people um, configure their work lives and understand, you know, what to do and how to do it. But if you have those, then it eliminates the need for, for human bosses and supervisors and, and overseers, etc. So there's some biology, some brain science involved in the fear that you described. Some people want that authority. They want to be able to tell people what to do. That's, that's the challenge. It has to be overcome intentionally and structurally, but it can be overcome. And the the benefits are, are compelling. Just the economics of savings on, on bureaucracy and hierarchy are, are absolutely compelling. So we try to reach a state where we can create a compelling vision of a desired future state that outweighs the fear and concern about losing control in the short term. There's some serious pressure on, on businesses now to, or especially employees at the employee level, to rethink their role, their place, and their who are they and why they're here and their place in the world. And, and that particularly shows up when we start having conversations about artificial intelligence and robotics and the whole idea that robots are going to take over your job. And, and then right away that instigates the, you know, that fear-based response. How is you know, the whole concept of self-management, a, a, a means to counteract that fear and, and can actually serve to to provide a different way of seeing these kinds of, of innovations. Well, I think one of the things we do in self-management is we're, we're very intentional about the use of language. So we actually don't talk about employees in self-management. The, the word employee, literal dic- dictionary definition employee is someone who works for another person for pay and that definition is is becoming more and more obsolete as we move forward into the future at morningstar we call people colleagues w l gore calls people associates uh, they're people who voluntarily engage around a mission vision purpose principles and values and, and pursue those and the colleagues uh, that I've worked with over the last 25 plus years never never been afraid of technology. And there have been massive uh, increases in technology over the years. It's not a new phenomenon. It didn't arise with AI and robotics. This has been an ongoing churning change since the late uh, 1800s. So um, if we even look at the tomato industry, we look at Things like mechanized harvesting. Yeah, I mean, we could have people out there with quote-unquote jobs who are picking tomatoes by hand, <laughs> moving them by baskets into trucks, and, and etc. But with the rise of mechanized harvesting, all those jobs disappeared. And that was uh, relatively recent, you know, in the, the early 1960s or so. So the idea of... Uh, uh, avoiding advances in technology is provably absurd and unrealistic. It is going to transform uh, work and the world. So when, when people think of themselves as autonomous agents, as people with free will, 
voluntarily associate with enterprises around a common purpose and mission. Really, the the, the um, fear of quote unquote losing one's job uh, becomes rather minor, and people look at themselves as um, free will uh, agents who are free to adapt and learn and grow. They they are are free to embrace the technology or go in a completely different direction into a, a different uh, economic realm. So it's really what, what uh, the philosopher Peter Kessenbaum talks about is courage. You know, it starts with free will, and then people have to embrace uh, their inner sense of courage and make choices that are in their own best interest, make sure those choices are ethical, figure out what is reality and reality has a lot to do with changing technology and it has today it has to do with artificial intelligence and robotics and recognize how reality is going to impact your particular world and then figure out a desired future state maybe it involves working with that technology maybe it involves going in a completely different direction but self-managers embrace free will and make choices that that work for them and so the idea of being afraid of the future tends to be rather minor where people that are willing to embrace that particular reality of free will and i love what you said there because it, it covers uh, quite a few things you know not just initiative but embedded in that is is of course freedom you know, that core value of freedom, the capacity to choose your own destiny and create it as you go. I'm going to go back to the CFO, you know, the the correction you made for me at the very beginning on CFO, because I know there's a lot of companies where CFO and the whole back end of companies is is a not necessarily uh, designed for self-management. They're more designed to do that, to control. So when you look at the role that someone who is looking after the money and their title shall remain nameless. <laughs> when we look at the role they play and the decisions they make, when I go into a traditional organization, it's real clear. They're always looking at the cost side. Very rarely are they actually looking at the benefit side. They're just looking at how some, and of course, from a neuroscience point of view, that just activates the fear in everyone because everyone in the organization is a cost. And so right away, you know, when they say talk about cut costs, it's, your name comes up in your head whether or not... Uh, it's accurate or not, that's there. What's the mindset that someone who's looking after the money inside self-managed companies brings to it that's different from the traditional mindset? I would describe my mindset in that role as someone who is playing a game. and It's the game of work. It's about being a steward of resources and being able to deploy resources in in the best possible way and furtherance of, of the mission of the enterprise. We had a, a model called a, a 24 month or two year cash flow model. And we never had a traditional budget. So we never like ha- hammered out an annual budget and and then tracked it month to month and and identified variances and then held people quote unquote accountable for variances in the budget. That was never part of the equation. Uh, We had a dynamic model, and it looked out, uh, it it reviewed past expenses and revenues, and then it looked out into the future at least two years, and you could look as far as you want. You could look out five years if you wanted to. Um, But this model was just a way to play what-if games with a, a giant spreadsheet. And well, what if uh, we did this to sales? What would be the impact on on uh, profit if we tweaked this cost or added this capital project or embraced this cost of goods sold or whatever variable we wanted to change? We would just play all kinds of games. So when we uh, borrow money from the bank, which you have to do in a seasonal operation, we just present different scenarios. Well, this could happen, this could happen, this can happen. We don't know what's going to happen. We're not prophets or seers. Or, um, we don't have a crystal ball, and here's some possibilities. So 
we want to prepare for all these possibilities and, and be ready for them. We want to be able to borrow as much money as we need for whatever possibilities exist. You know, they're just scenarios, and we're, we're playing the game of work, and we're playing lots of what-if games. And so sometimes the what-if games result in a great year, and sometimes they don't. But it's just a constant dynamic exercise of uh, playing a game and and understanding you know what the variables are so that was uh to me what was fun about a self-managed enterprise uh at a fairly large scale it's this idea of constant gamification and uh, looking at various scenarios and possibilities and and then watching to see what unfolds Uh, i suspect that's different from many companies where they do have these <laughs> these rigid budget processes in place that are extraordinarily time consuming and tedious and difficult and so um, I'm just grateful that uh, I was able to grow up a system that allowed us to gamify budgets to a large extent and uh, not have to get it absorbed with all that uh, kind of tedium that I, I suspect takes place in most companies. On speaking of games, let's just play one. If someone, if if, if someone in the company decided they wanted to m- do something expensive, like take a risk and invest or whatever it is, what are the checks and balances? What are the what happens when when someone decides to play with that? Does everybody sit down and look at the spreadsheet? What's the process that allows that kind of transparency and responsibility to each other to play out? Well, it's a really two levels, Donna. It's um, uh, first of all, we have this concept of decision right. So, who's who owns the right to make a particular decision, and and decision rights are negotiated in advance. People understand what the scope of and quantum uh, of their decision making authority is for a given process. Uh, they understand their decision rights. Are they a decision maker for for a process, uh, or are they merely making recommendations, or are they a decision maker that must receive recommendations first? You know, exactly what is uh, one's decision-making authority. So if you own a particular decision, then and that, that includes acquiring uh, and developing a new process or acquiring a new piece of equipment, then you, know, you own it. You're, you get to do it. You make that decision, and people can ask you about it afterwards or, or even before or during, but... but it's your decision until you negotiate those decision rights away. Um, so there's that level. But then if someone you know comes up with a new idea, a new innovation, then they really have to you know make a business case and sell it to people that will be affected by that decision. And so we've had that uh, happen. I've seen that happen many times. One year, a high level mechanic came up with an idea to handle materials in a factory and sketched out an engineering design and talked to stakeholders who would be affected and talked to someone involved in finance and made sure there was money available for for a project and implemented the project and and saved a ton of money and had a huge return on investment. So the great thing about self-management is that uh, everyone's free to innovate, everyone's free to lead, and then decisions result from taking the initiative to uh, make sure that stakeholders who are impacted ha- have a chance to have input. Uh, there, there are those sort of decisions that come up, like that one, and then there are sort of pre-allocated decision rights that are already baked into voluntary agreement between peers. So that makes it a lot clearer then for people. They know they know exactly what the process is. It, you know, in terms of the the power being distributed, you know exactly how to follow that so that you respect each other. Sounds like. Yeah, I mean, it can take a little research. You may have to spend some time doing some stakeholder identification and figuring out who to talk to and figuring out how to frame your request and and uh, figuring out how to you know pay for things, but. Everything can be figured out. There are no inherent barriers to collaboration and, and figuring things out together with other people. 
And where does the customer fit in that conversation? Are they part of the stakeholder group then? Well, it depends on the decision. So if it's a decision that affects customers, I would say yes at a conceptual level. But if it's merely a question of cost reduction or efficiency or something that only affects customers very indirectly, then they may not be a stakeholder to a particular decision. So it really just depends on the decision. Let's talk a bit about protocols or principles. Are there any particular anchors in the self-management framework that make that ensure people have a backstop if they get to a you know, one of those conundrums where it's either this or it's that or or there's a a higher level of strategy versus operation? Is there any particular protocols that help people sort things out? In terms of protocols, the, the most important thing is that Everything's based on request and response. So every individual has a, an affirmative obligation to respond to professional requests made by colleagues. If people want something from another colleague, they have an obligation to make a request. And that's, uh, that's baked into the principles of self-management because command authority doesn't exist. See, if you can't tell people what to do, the only thing left is to make a request. I would say that takes place at, at, at all levels, whether it's strategy or, or uh, operations or, or sales or distribution or R&D or quality, whatever it happens to be, and whatever level of complexity or even whatever level of importance. It really it comes down to request and response, figuring things out together. Let's back up a bit and take a look at what's going on in the world right now, in the world of business and the future of work. What are you seeing? You've been talking to a lot of different people all over the world and uh, different companies, different stages of their mindset, different stages of how they're you know, contemplating self-management and, and making the, the transformation, stepping into the transformation. What, what, what kinds of threads have you been witnessing and, and what do you see ahead? Well... I would just say at a macro level, the interest in better ways of working is, is truly a global phenomenon. As I look at the, uh, my upcoming travel schedule, and I'm looking at comp- uh, countries like Russia and Brazil and Denmark and Poland and Germany and uh, all across the USA and all around the world, Companies are, are interested in better ways of working, and these are large companies. They're small companies. They're uh, medium-sized. They're in every business sector you can imagine. Healthcare, communications, manufacturing, transportation, every conceivable sector, uh, every conceivable part of the world, the drivers for change are, are, and the pressures for change are enormous. And I think irresistible at some level. So leaders uh, globally are are recognizing that uh, they have to adapt uh, their organizations to the the current realities and and the future realities that that they see on the horizon. And, And it's a matter of existential survival. You know, how are we gonna create a company that can uh, embrace and work with uh, artificial intelligence and robotics and nanotechnology and genetic engineering and blockchain technology and and uh, the things that are probably going to be just as disruptive, if not more disruptive, than the internet itself. I write in my book about Meetup.com, and Meetup is a a wonderful example of a, a company on the cutting edge of of technology, but uh, centering it around human beings and around people and their need to socialize and connect. And I mean, they're actually talking about uh, major investments in being able to curate meetups without human organizers using artificial intelligence and geo-positioning. And they're locked in battle royal with uh, Facebook uh, around this these possibilities. So it's going to be just fascinating to uh, observe and watch over the coming years as 
as uh, companies uh, adapt and uh, reconfigure themselves to the new realities, not only of the marketplace, but of technology and of uh, organizational design itself. It's just going to be a fascinating time worldwide. And not to mention virtual reality and what, what kinds of contribution and augmented reality and, and what that means. And, and, of course, what came to mind as you were talking about Meetup was the Facebook workplaces, the work they're doing behind the scenes on that. So, yes, you're absolutely right. It's going to be extremely interesting. And we're all a part of it in one way or shape or form. I think one of the things I appreciate about what you've described in the self-management, in the, in the self-management framework is the idea that because people are self-managers, and, and the distinction between the language of the traditional and the language of what going forward is is critically important, I think. But when you understand they're self-managers, then it, it does give built-in and embedded autonomy to everything you do. So uh, no longer do you have this notion that, that we can't jump from employer, or employee, I should say. If you're in a traditional mindset, yes, but if you're in someone who is working in a self-managed company, the whole jump to entrepreneurship is is not a jump at all. It's it's a flow. It's it's I'm already there. So it's yeah. It it changes completely the the uh, flexibility and the agility internally of the dynamics. I think, and particularly to respond outside conditions. So, tell us more about how companies do respond out outside conditions. When when things change, a who knows and and what happens inside. That's a great question, Donna, and I think the best answer I can give is to look at a company in China that is doing some extremely cutting-edge work around that, and that's the higher corporation. They're the world's largest appliance manufacturer, and they're led by a very visionary leader uh, named Jean Renin, uh, who started the company uh, back in the uh, early 80s and took over a decrepit manufacturing company. And he turned it into the world's largest appliance manufacturer with some 70 to 80,000 colleagues worldwide, uh, all across the world. His vision was to create an uh, innovation platform. So he broke the company down into 4,000 self managed teams. And he's, each team is self contained innovation platform, and each team is multidisciplinary. So they have marketing and the product development and information technology uh, things embedded into each team. And so uh, these teams are free to come up with new products. And many of the products that they develop contain you know, what we refer to today as the Internet of Things. So the products are, are out there in, in the world, whether they're water purification systems or refrigerators or televisions or whatever it happens to be and and they're collecting information, data, and hire is looking at these massive streams of data on a continuous basis and identifying new products and services that they can innovate based on what they're seeing in, in the data analytics. And so one of the things they recently found was that uh, they were collecting data on water quality throughout China. They found that they could configure water systems that were adapted to the specific quality of water in a particular town or location and create solutions uh, for that area that were superior and that people were willing to pay for. So using technology and using uh, information and combining that with self-management has really created a, an incredible company in the higher group and it's going to be uh, really interesting to watch them as they develop and build out their model over the next uh, coming years. Well, and I know they've reinvented themselves numerous times and I, I think a lot of that has to do with the capacity of the visionary leadership at the top to sort of lay it out and then get out of the way. So it's, it's, a, it's a really great example. I appreciate you breaking it down because that, that offers insight that, um, I mean, I know our, our call, mutual colleague, Rod Collins, has written an article about it on Great Workplaces, Huffington Post Great Workplace segment. So it's, uh, there's more information there, but thank you for that. That, that was extremely um, helpful. Any thoughts you want to share, Doug, with, uh, with, with listeners before... Well, it's uh, 
uh, it's an exciting time to be alive if you're paying attention to the future of work. And so um, uh, I believe in the power of story and, and the, the power of stories to uh, drive a, a compelling vision of a desired future state. And so um, if anyone has any great stories of uh, uh, organizational transformation, companies transitioning from command and control uh, to uh, self-managed ecosystems or starting up uh, and putting a stake in the ground and, and becoming self-managed enterprises. I'd, I'd love to hear those stories because uh, they are compelling and the, uh, the stories do drive change. Well, and then, and then what happens is Doug shares the stories with me, and then I end up interviewing the people on the podcast. <laughs> so it's a lovely, a lovely connection. That's how we have Stephanie Glauden on here, who applied read read Doug's book, uh, the first, the earlier edition, Beyond Empowerment, and then applied it to business school, which I think is extremely brilliant. So that that program is on the um, Insight to Action podcast. If you wouldn't mind, I mean, you and I, went informally, before we started this conversation, we're talking about where you're going to be in the, this fall. How would you like to just read off the list of countries you're heading for, just to give people a real taste for what global means in this kind of directional shift that we're underway, we're in the midst of? Well, these aren't in order, in any particular order, but so far on the list looks like Russia, Brazil, Denmark, Sweden, Poland, Germany, and the Netherlands. There you go. Now, and we know Europe has already been pretty active in this area. What about the United States? What's going on in the United States and Canada, to your, to your knowledge? Yeah, North America is very active in the future work movement. There's more conferences than, uh, and workshops than a human being could possibly attend here in North America uh, around the future of work. And so uh, those conferences, uh, the articles like by Rod Collins and, and books and podcasts by yourself, Donna, and others. And all these things are penetrating the consciousness of, of organizational leaders everywhere, and not just in business, but nonprofits and governments as well. I just gave a talk to the Department of Homeland Security here in the United States about the future of work. Once leaders hear about these ideas and these concepts, uh, they want to learn more, and then that's when they start reaching out and talking to people about, you know, how can I start experimenting uh, with change and figuring out how to adapt my organization. So that's what's happening. It's all sectors, all sizes, all different kinds of organizations. If they're not studying this or if they're not aware of it, they soon will be in Many of them are, are studying it and deciding to uh, take some steps uh, toward change as well. So uh, change is everywhere. Yeah, very exciting times. Where do people find your book and you? So I would uh, go to newfocusgroupusa.com. N-U-F-O-C-U-S group USA, all one word, dot com. And that's the best place to go. Great. Great, and the book is through the usual places. It is, Beyond Empowerment. Awesome. Doug, thanks very much once again for being on the program. Uh, and having a conversation with you is always delightful, and, and so I'm, I'm excited to now offer listeners uh, to this podcast another slice or an update of where things are at as this momentum is starting to build quite quickly. Thanks very much, Donna. Doug, in this conversation, made a direct appeal for stories of transformation that you or your company, or somebody you know has done with their company, regardless of the size. And I'm going to add my voice to that because I'm working on uh, the book for self-management that would help inspire people and provide a little bit of support and guide for working, uh, working your way through the transformation. So if you do have any companies that you are keen about, that you find that the work that was done, maybe it's not perfect because actually it shouldn't be perfect ever. It's always a bit messy. Please reach out and let me know through LinkedIn or through Twitter or through my Facebook page from Insight to Action. I'll share, of course, the stories with Doug and we'll both work on sharing them with, with you and the rest of the world. So thank you. This is how we build an ecosystem of support for the changes underway. Before I forget, The Intelligence of the Cosmos by Irvin Laszlo is coming out in October 16th, published by Inner Traditions. You can get it on Amazon. I've contributed a chapter on emotion 
epigenetics and networks and how to work properly with networks in that, which is underneath the title of the new purpose of business, which of course implies a much higher purpose than uh, the one we're currently seeing in the uh, mainstream thinking. So yeah, please, please take a look at that. I also want to remind you that I'm a practitioner. It looks like all I do is write and podcast, but no, actually I am a practitioner. And so if you have any situations where it's complex, it's messy, uh, there's a combination of decision-making, leadership, and mindset at play, and and you'd like uh, an outside view, whether you're doing the change inside yourself, working magic, and would like just somebody to see it, oversee it from the outside, or whether you want someone to come in and get their hands dirty with you and and structure some decision-making awareness so that better decisions can be made, please reach out to me via Twitter, EP Donna, D-A-W-N-A, underscore Jones, website from insighttoaction.com, or, of course, LinkedIn and Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash from insight to action. Thanks so much for listening. See you in a couple weeks.